Hello. Every week I try to put a little video out to help anyone who wants to watch to understand a little bit of historical context. Sometimes it's nice to uh, understand what's going on, who's speaking, what are they talking about, where are they at, what's going on around them. That adds depth and meaning and can deepen understanding to what's being said in there. So with that said, this week's Come Follow Me readings is the Book of Mormon, uh, Mormon chapters 7, 8, and 9. Uh, three chapters that really have a lot going on uh, contextually. Plus, there's some great content in there, and I'll show you just a little bit of that as well. I want to start in Mormon chapter 9, so if you'll, or excuse me, Mormon chapter 7. So if you'll go to chapter 7, I'd like to uh, uh, just, again, give a little background. This is Mormon writing. Uh, almost all of the Nephites have been destroyed at this time. They're all killed. There's almost nobody left. And Mormon is going to finish his writings up. In fact, this chapter concludes all of Mormon's words. So what is he going to talk about? I mean, if you had the last thing that you could say to anybody, and you're about to give the plates to your son, and there's nobody left that's righteous that will listen, what's your message? Would you go to chapter 7, verse 2? Know ye that, know ye that ye are of the house of Israel. Know ye that ye must come unto repentance or you cannot be saved. It's all about repentance. He wants them to know who they are. Notice, they're the house of Israel, but they need to repent. And maybe we fit somewhere in there as well. So I have a quote that I really like. It's from Elder uh, Maxwell about repentance. And notice the phrase, come unto repentance. Elder Maxwell said, no part of walking by faith is more difficult than walking the road of repentance. However, with faith unto repentance, we can push roadblocks out of the way, moving forward to beg God for mercy. True contrition brings full capitulation. One simply surrenders, caring only about what God thinks, not what they think while meekly offering O oh God, make thyself known unto me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee. Giving away all, all our sins is the only way we can come to know God. I really like that. Come unto repentance is the only way that we can come unto God. Just a great quote, and I hope uh, maybe that's helpful in your in your studies uh, this week, because there's a lot about repentance in chapter 7 in here. If you'll go down to verse 8 now, we see that, Therefore repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and lay hold upon the gospel of Christ. I mean, that's really his message, is please repent come unto repentance. That faith that leads us to repentance is the only thing that will bring us faith to come unto Christ. And that's really uh, Mormon's message here. And as you read through this, when he concludes at the end of verse 10, uh, 10 the last verse of chapter 7, he says, amen. That's the end of his writings. Now, if you'll go to chapter 8, here is the beginning of, of Moroni's records. And Moroni only thinks he's going to write a few words. Uh, really, just what's left here. In fact, verse 1, I, Moroni, do finish the record of my father. Behold, I have but few things to write. Well, what is he going to write? Well, he's just going to say what has happened since his father gave him the record. Uh, and verse 2, the middle of verse 2, the great and tremendous battle of Cumorah. Behold, the Nephites who had escaped into the country southward were hunted by the Lamanites until they were all destroyed. And verse 3 says, And my father also was killed by them. I, even I, remain alone. To tell the sad tale. So Moroni receives the record from his father. His father's been killed. He's it. There's nobody left except him. So I want, and then he mentions the year, 400 years have passed away. So we're at 401 when he has these records. But there is something interesting that happens between verse 13 and 14. Uh, verse th 13, it appears he concludes his record. I am the son of Mormon. 
and my father was a descendant of, of Nephi. And then verse 14, he starts out with, I am the same who hideth up this record unto the, unto the Lord. So I, we really don't know what's going on here, but it appears that there's a time gap between verse 13 and 14. Uh, some theorize that maybe he had buried the plates and hid them up, but a time has passed. He gets them back out of the ground and he decides, hey, I have some time. I'm going to add more. And he writes the remainder of, of chapter 8 where he prophesies about the latter days. The Book of Mormon is going to come forth in a time and he gives a long list of this is what it's going to be like which is interesting when you read this. As you go through and read this, he talks about pollutions and crime and wars. All of the things that we see in our day today, he he prophesied about. So it's fun. You can make a list on a paper or on a board and, and as a family or, or by yourself, go through the list and say, has this happened yet? Is this what's going to happen? Some really neat things in there uh, that he prophesies in the end of chapter 8. And then if you'll just go to chapter 9, uh, who is he going to write to in chapter 9? He declares immediately the very first verse, I speak concerning those who do not believe in Christ. That's what chapter 9 is about. It's all about, I'm going to talk to those that don't believe. And he's going to make a case of why they should believe and so forth. So read that with that in mind of who he's talking about. And then if you'll go down a little bit, I mean, he talks about miracles and why aren't there miracles? And he says it's because you don't believe and so forth. So if you'll go down to verse, let's go to the end, verse 33, where he's talking about the record. Verse 32 actually is where it begins. He lets us know that he's writing in a language that they called, he called, Reformed Egyptian. And it's been handed down and altered by us. Now, again, we're a thousand years after Nephi. So I just want you to, again, get that concept. How, what does a thousand years do to a language? The, the reformed Egyptian that they're writing in, did it look like anything that Nephi was writing in? Probably not. It's probably been changed. I mean, just look at the modern English language. We have TV and radio and music and recordings of what people sound like. Even though we came from uh, Britain, uh, here in America, uh, the American dialect d sounds uh, quite a bit different than the British dialect. And what we talk and how we speak and the words we use in the meaning today, quite different than even a few hundred years ago. I mean, think about even the King James Version of the Bible. It's an what we would call a very old, formal English. Sounds quite a bit different today. And that's with all of the current and modern recordings and so forth. So we know what people sound like. And we can use those same words. English spelling has changed. You know, you go read the old English. It's kind of unique and kind of different uh, than what we would use today, which is very more formalized and we have set rules for grammar and so forth. You can imagine, that's only a couple hundred years, but can you imagine a thousand years where they didn't have any of those benefits? The language that the Nephites and Lamanites spoke was probably very, very different than what Lehi and Nephi and uh, families spoke a thousand years previously. But notice verse 33, he says, and if our plates had been sufficiently large, we should have written in Hebrew. So again, somehow the Egyptian is a condensed, shorter language to write, whereas the Hebrew is much more elaborate. Now, I'm not a scholar in the Hebrew language. I have some friends that could tell me how much uh, more space it's taken to write in Hebrew than it is in English and so forth. Uh, but he does say in verse 33 that the Hebrew language would have no imperfection. Again, maybe it's more elaborate, more detailed. Uh, I know in translation from English to other languages, sometimes in the English language we have multiple words where in one language they just have one word, so it's more concise or vice versa. But it does change with that. Verse 33, there is something that I want to point out. It says, But the Lord knoweth the things which we have written, and also that none other people knoweth our language. 
again, I, I, we don't know much context behind that line in there, but it appears that there's other people out there that Moroni knows. He goes, they don't understand our language. Maybe there's other groups of people that have different languages, and the Lamanites and Nephites don't communicate with them. They just don't understand their language. But the most important part is that at the end of verse 34, as he has prepared a means for the interpretation thereof. Well, we know that there's instruments and there's tools that the Lord has used for the translation purposes. But most importantly, Joseph Smith gave the best answer. By the gift and power of God is how these things are translated. How these things are translated. Now, again, verse 37 makes it appear that Moroni's finished with his translation. He's done which we know that he's not done. And we also uh, have some great insights of what happened to Moroni. I mean, what happened to him in the very end? Uh, Joseph Smith told some very interesting stories about how Moroni died. So when we get to the book of Moroni and we get to the end of his writings, I'll share a few of those stories with you. Meanwhile, have a great week and enjoy studying the last three chapters of Mormon.